Cheers, guys. Epics 911. Welcome to the Sunday, January 22nd, 2017 edition of VR News. I want to start with a news story on Kickstarter virtual reality devices. This started out as a story. I was simply going to talk about a VR device from the other day. Then I noticed that there was another article on another website about another kickstarted VR device. Then it was going to be an article about how the two compared, how I felt one was going to be successful and the other not. And then it just kind of grew into a whole new story. One about Kickstarter in general with regards to virtual reality too. And that's kind of what I want to talk about. And for anyone who doesn't know, which probably isn't a lot of people, but you never know. People who don't go around on the internet a lot or surf or any of that, they just may not know. But Kickstarter is basically a, it's a platform through which creators, and it can be a content creator, somebody who's making videos, a movie, music, video game, a product, a service with product implications, any of those kind of things. They go to Kickstarter, they generally will make a pitch video and look for funding to make that happen. That's it in a nutshell, okay? And you can probably guess it doesn't always turn out well. <laughs> and the first question that I get asked, Epics, are there scammers? When people ask me, and if it's at work, you know, I might have a boss who's asked me that before. In fact, I know she has. And my answer is, uh, yes, there are scammers. There's pretty much scammers everywhere. But I think a lot of the products that ultimately fail, those people had noble intentions when they started. I don't think most of them start out looking to scam people. They just get in over their head. They have no business acumen couldn't write a business plan to save their life, don't know the basics about accounting and budgeting and bookkeeping. They get in over their heads. The human fight or flight reflex kicks in. Precious few choose to fight. Many flee. And the people who backed that are left high and dry. There are examples where somebody chooses to fight and you may still despise him for it, but at least Neil Stevenson recognized, and he did a Kickstarter, he's a popular writer, he was going to do a sword fighting game, realized he was in over his head, and basically told his backers. Now, apparently some funds were returned, not all, because a lot of it was consumed, but at least he had the balls to come forward and acknowledge that. A lot don't. So there's a few Kickstarters that I'm going to put up here. My rules personally for Kickstarters, and why don't we start with a picture of just kind of what I've backed. And it's not foolproof by any means, but it just shows you how it's going to vary from person to person. But my criteria is simply, I don't, it's not as important what it is. What's more important to me is that the person has a proven track record in bringing something like this to market. Now, sometimes it's a new innovation or idea, and of course they would have had no practical experience. It's from those people that I expect a damn good pitch with a business plan, with some kind of supply chain understanding, just something. Most of these people don't have that. They never convey any of that and as a result, I ignore them. So the ones that I backed tend to be video games. Half of the list, Brian Fargo, who is president in Exile Gaming Studios, was president of Interplay. He's got experience bringing games from concept to market. There's an indie company that I supported because, again, they've brought games from concept to market. And for all these that I've backed, their supply chain plans extend beyond the Kickstarter. They've got agreements in place with Steam, etc. So those are the ones that I support and I tend to have a pretty good track record with them as a result of that. It also though really narrows the type of projects that I'll support, right? 
So those are kind of my rules. So here's the six real quick. We've got the Two Eyes VR360 camera. If you know a little bit about how vision works in humans, probably not the best idea from a technical point of view. I would not back this myself. Not to say others shouldn't, but if you listen to some of my other criteria about supply chain models and retail alliances and business plans, these guys conveyed none of that in their pitch video. Nothing to give me confidence. This next one is basically called Verge VR Dock. It's basically a charging station. It's a block of plastic on a block of wood with two USB cables threaded into it. If that sounds like I'm being negative, I'm actually being complimentary because compared to the first one and all the rest of the products I'm gonna mention here, it's the one that stands the best chance of actually making it to market. They fought it through, there's no complicated electronics, none of that. It's a block of wood on a block of plastic with two USB cables threaded through it, right? Doesn't mean I like it, but if somebody were to ask me, what do you think, Epix? Are my chances of, of getting this product good? I would say of the five, the best. The third one is called the Virtual 360 Fit. We've talked about this before in the past. Those of you like me who sweat profusely, not a good idea at all. Then you've got people with motion sickness who would probably be sweating and vomiting. Also not a good idea. But for everyone like me or like the motion sickness person, you know, there are people who are going to be able to do this. One of the viewers, Chris, that I chat with frequently, you know, does daily audio shield, for example. It's a great form of cardio for him, but he probably doesn't sweat by the gallon liter like I do, right? So yeah, that's another product. I just don't see it working because of its singular focus on fitness and VR. I just think that's this early in the game with this type of bulky HMD, a losing proposition. Now, the next two that I'm going to mention have both already failed, but you'll probably get a good idea of why. The first one's called Glove One. And when I talk about the fight or flight instinct, these guys fled. They stopped radio communication, tucked tail between legs, and ran away. Didn't have the nards to tell people they screwed up. And that's why, like I said, it doesn't make Stevenson... Well, it does. It makes him better in my books because at least he manned up, womaned up, whatever you want to call it. He was able to tell people. And it's better than running and being silent. This last one, Control VR Motion, half a million dollars. They doubled their goal. December of 2015, their last communication. They've been radio silent ever since. And they've got people on the comment section. You can read through just the first page still looking for this individual to sue him. They've tracked him down somewhere on the West Coast, and who knows how that's going to end. But right now, they are still separated from their money, which brings us up to the last thing I want to talk about, and that's obviously buyer beware, caveat emptor. We all understand that, but nowhere is that more important than on a platform like Kickstarter. Your risk is much higher than simply walking into a retail store buying something and walking out, right? You've got a lot of conveniences when you buy something from an established retailer that you're just not going to have in these scenarios in terms of recourse. Yeah, just curious. I'll end it with how has your luck been with Kickstarters? Have you supported any? What's your ratio? Success to failure? Very curious. All right, next news story, guys. YouTube virtual reality wants to provide tools to make things that even they never thought about a reality. And this all took place at the Sundance Festival. YouTube was there and Upload VR spoke to Jamie Byrne. He is YouTube's director of creators and VR initiatives. They talked to him about YouTube. He mentioned the piece that I talked about the other day with PlayStation 4 launching there but also talked about extending the functionality beyond 360. Because let's face it, the headline reads VR, but really what they're talking about is 360 degree video. 
Virtual reality HMDs are, are vessels. They're, they're a means to view 360 degree content, but that's not really virtual reality. And I know we beat that to death every few months. I think it bears repeating. So one of the things that they want to do, what Jamie Burns says YouTube wants to do is extend that into actual tools for actual virtual reality, not just 360 degree video plugins. So very cool, but besides that, completely devoid of any examples. But it will be interesting to see if they do have tools currently in development, hearing about them, maybe E3, maybe at some of the other events this year, at least to provide us with an idea of the direction roadmap YouTube is headed in with regards to virtual reality. So check that out. Uh, like I said, that was an interview at Sundance, link below. Now, this next story, Vive Tracker bringing easier virtual reality hacking. I thought this was a neat article. It was on Hackaday. And what I liked about it is it shows the response from your typical hacker community types to a device and how that contrasts when the device is from a company that's fairly open and transparent about that technology versus how they tend to treat the technology of those who don't follow suit. Now, I'm in no way suggesting companies have to be open and transparent. My personal opinion, I think they're gonna run better that way. I think it's better for the community at large to have a company that supports being open as opposed to completely closed. But at the end of the day, that's still their business right, right? We can vote with our wallets and not choose to support that or choose to support it, whichever. But, um, yeah, it was interesting because they were talking about the Vive Tracker in this article. You can see that at the link, how even the engineers were helpful on reverse engineering aspects of the tracker, which I thought was cool because there's some other companies, hell would freeze over before you would see, for example, a Sony engineer <laughs> discussing reverse engineering with anybody. So very neat article and hopefully that leads to the real kind of innovation in VR that, that I think we're looking for, that hasn't really arrived en masse yet. And a perfect example of that is Doom 3 BFG. Easily in my top four virtual reality game slash experience since launch of the devices last year. And it was just a hobbyist homebrew side project, cobbled together and released. Those types of cool technologies, you know, inventions, whatever you want to call them, are what I think comes out of open architecture. Once, it doesn't have to be hackers, but really hobbyist enthusiasts with skill get their hands on this, all kinds of cool things can happen. So, very, very neat article just to give you some, you know, pause to think about how that differs from a closed model. Next news story, this one is more of an art roundup. It's also the last story for today. Uh, I was going to talk about this yesterday. This is some art that Upload VR got from Sketchfab. Now, Sketchfab is a way to display 3D model of things created in other products. There are some really cool examples here on Sketchfab. There's Hulk Smash, which was the original one that caught my eye. Go to this link. You can literally load them in your browser and manipulate them. The Hulk one is cool. It is very, very cool. That was done with Oculus Medium. The next one is Fishing Boat from Tilt Brush. Also very cool, very detailed model on that one. Third one is Angry Fox from Quillustration, which are just a charming cartoon look. You could see that as a either a web comic or a series of animated shorts. I think that Fox character looks amazing. And then the fourth one that they show is Spaceship from Gravity Sketch, which also looks very detailed and cool. Anyways, I then decided to go to Sketchfab and take a look for myself and seriously do that. Go there, look up the uh, editor favorites, look up the community favorites, and you're gonna see some pretty cool stuff. Two that stood out for me, Spacewalk, which is freaking amazing looking, Biomechanical Whale, also very cool looking, 
But the one that really got me excited was from or Orlean Martel. It's basically a replica of Mirror's Edge, the game Apartment, reconstructed to practice his low polygon baking skills, which I thought was really cool. Some awesome artwork there. I know that I, sh I shared some of the viewer stuff last week. Uh, like that, just very cool and interesting to look at for just seeing a whole different side of VR, the artistic side. All right, guys, that is it for VR news on this Sunday. Hope you guys have an awesome work week. I know it's here again, but there you go. Cheers, as always.